Okay, um, so I think uh, it's a good time to start. Uh, welcome to the Exit 22 session on uh, program analysis. I'm Shachar Maoz, I'm a professor at Tel Aviv University. I served on the ICSI program committee and I will be chairing this uh, session. We have a, a great program of six uh, presentations coming from uh, different ICSI tracks. Uh, the software engineering in practice track, the journal first track, technical track, and new ideas track, so very different tracks. Uh, but all papers relate to some form of program analysis uh, in, in actually very different ways. Um, so in the coming hour, we will have six presentations of uh, five minutes each, followed by a, a discussion of uh, all the papers together. So during the presentations, you are, uh, everyone is welcome to write questions. You may uh, write them down in the chat. Uh, that would be very uh, useful. So the speakers can uh, answer them uh, during the discussion or in the chat itself. And given that we have six different talks, please do not wait with your questions. Uh, it's, it's really best to write them down in the chat uh, when you have them and not wait with them uh, until the end. Um, when you write a question, please write the name of the speaker it is addressed to. Uh, this is just uh, an advice. Uh, so uh, last word before we start, I will be managing the time to keep us on schedule. So I ask the presenters uh, as planned to keep their talks within the five minutes uh, limit. And uh, if there is a, if it's necessary, I'll give a, a reminder about the time. Uh, but I, I hope it will be not necessary. So let us start with the first presentation, uh, a journal first presentation uh, on exposing vulnerabilities in inter contract scenarios. Fuchen, uh, please uh, share your slides, and yes. everybody else, please mute, mute yourself. Everybody else. Okay, thank you. So I'll begin and start uh, sharing my screen. Yes, please. Okay, can you, can you see that? Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, it's grateful to be the first presenter of this session. And my name is Fu Chen Ma from Tsinghua University. And my research focuses on blockchain security. Today, I'm going to introduce you a tool named Pluto to expose vulnerabilities in intercontract scenarios. And this is a joint work with University of Waterloo and WeBank. And intercontract vulnerabilities refer to the bugs hidden intercontract costs. And here's an example of the intercontract vulnerability. In the first contract named the rule contract, it defines the threshold calculation rules of an investment. And the threshold depends on the target year of the investment. And the other contract named investor contract is used to invest the tokens to each target. And if the investment amount is more than 300,000, 1% uh, of the threshold value will be deducted as the handling charge. And the contract investor contract has an overflow vulnerability. If a malicious investor inputs a large value of the invest token, there will be an overflow in the ad operation. And we tested the example with uh, several state-of-the-art tools, including symbolic execution tools like LINIT and MassRail, fuzzing tools like SFAS and LF, and static analysis tools like SmartCheck and Scurify. As the table one shows, uh, all the tools fall to report the true vulnerability. And both symbolic execution tools report another ad operation as a vulnerability, which is actually a false alarm. And generally, the existing tools fall in intercontract signals for two reasons. The first, is, the first is they fail to collect the semantic information from intercontract logic. And second, they fall to check the past reachability co correctly. Tools like OINIT act uh, like this when processing this, this example. First, OINIT tool uh, excuse the execution code size of code. And if the code code exists, OINIT then executes the call opcode. And if the execution succeeds, OINIT will load the results from the memory and return the data. When processing with the call opcode, OINIT first pops seven elements from the stack and then pushes back one to the stack 
which indicates that the call is successful. However, when the opcode M load tries to load the return data from the memory, it gets the signature of the called function, which is a very big number. And in this case, uh, this huge number has been assigned to the variable named threshold. Consequently, the first condition of the if branch in that co example code cannot be satisfied, and the else branch will then be executed. And this leads to the false negative and the false positive by our unit. And this figure shows the overall architecture of Pluto. And the inputs of the system are the target contract as well as the code contracts. And the outputs are bug reports and some advice for developers on how to fix those vulnerabilities. And there are three steps in the Pluto system. The first is SESG construction, and the second is SPC detection and the bug validation. And with these steps, Pluto can successfully uh, support bug detection in intercontract scenarios. It first detects intercontract vulnerabilities by constructing an intercontract CFG. First, it constructs intercontract CFG, then it splits the blocks with an, uh, an call, a call opcode. And finally, it links the blocks with return opcode. After that, Pluto collects intercontract pass constraints. It first collects the inner contract constraints. Then it analyzes the call relation and calculates the intercontract variables constraints. And the evaluation collected on fifthly constructed con con uh, contract. As a result, Pluto can detect 80% of the injected intercontract vulnerabilities. And the vulnerabilities that Pluto failed to detect is due to the unreachable address of the Kali contract. As for the solidified data site as shown in, uh, in Table 3, Pluto reported 681 valid uh, vulnerabilities on 100 contracts, which is the best of all the tools. Uh, we then evaluated Pluto on and other four tools on 8,173 real world solidity, uh, solidity fails with uh, 39,443 smart contracts. And the result shows that Pluto can find the most vulnerabilities in real world contracts. Moreover, Pluto can detect 36 intercontract vulnerabilities, while other tools can only find 12 and 16 uh, respects, respectively. And that's all. For more details, please, ref please refer to our paper published in Attribute ETSE. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Fu Chen, for an interesting talk. Uh, everyone, if you have uh, questions, you're welcome to write them already in the chat. And we will now move directly to the second speaker, Tan Dat. Uh, who will talk about the analysis of graph neural networks. Um, I hope that everyone uh, would be able to see my screen. I'm Tang Dat from the University of Melbourne, and we are the research group associated with the University of Melbourne and the University of Science and Technology and George Mason University. Uh, I'll be talking about a brief presentation of the work towards the analysis of graph neural network. So um, the reason we want to analyze a graph neural network is that it is quite useful toward the, a set of graph-based problem. Since it's taking input as a graph, it can be very useful in the domain of like knowledge graph uh, inference uh, reasoning, uh, molecular property uh, inference, uh, Scene graph classification and also the popular social network application. Uh, given that the graph neural network is a relatively powerful type of deep neural network, it is still have the same black box property as other type of deep neural network, meaning that we do not know what happened inside the graph neural network. And recent paper has also shown that the graph neural network is prone to be attacked by changing a few node attribute or edge, uh, we can easily make the JNN change its prediction. We believe that one of the solution towards this is bringing or adopting the work from feed forward neural network analysis to the graph neural network. Uh, but there exist some major challenges coming from the difference 
between the feedforward neural network and the graph neural network. The major difference is their input. While the feedforward neural network takes inputs that only the single vector, the graph neural network takes inputs as a graph, where each node and edge can also be associated with the feature vector themselves. This leads to two major challenges. The first is dynamic computation. Since the graph neural network takes input as a graph and the number of node and edge in the input graph can be arbitrarily large, this would mean that the input vector into the graph neural network can be also of arbitrary size. This would make the current work on feed forward neural network analysis unable to proceed because of the varying number of input variables. The second is even when we manage to fix the structure in which the graph neural network working on, the run out computation would still be relatively large. We approximate that each layer of the graph neural network would be about the number of edge time larger than the normal fit for the network. And our framework, the JNN and infer came in. The JNN and infer major contribution lies in two key points. The first is that it's leveraged the uh, uh, the first is that it's leveraged the most frequent influential substructure. In brief, these influential substructure are the subset of node and edge that have significant contribution towards the target prediction of the graph neural network. This uh, gives them two important properties. The first is that their computation approximate the computation of the full graph neural network. This would make the analysis on their computation be approximately close to the original computation of graph neural network on the full graph. And the second is that since these substructure are fixed size and small, it would help us address the aforementioned challenge of dynamic computation and also scales. We also introduce a new mechanism that leverages these influential substructure. By unrolling the JNN computation on each of these substructure, into an equivalent feedforward neural network. The JNN infer can leverage existing feedforward neural network analysis tool to analyze the JNN property on each substructure. And we also find the required predicate for this property to statistically hold on the full graph. Finally, the JNN infer would output the property in the form of the precondition on the input implying the post condition on the target prediction of the graph neural network. Uh, yes, so that is for this brief presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Than that. Um, I remind everyone that you are welcome to write uh, questions in the chat. And we will move uh, directly to the third speaker, um, a paper from the Software Engineering in Practice uh, track on static analysis framework for data science notebooks. Uh, please, Pavel. Okay, I'm sharing the screen. Everyone can hear me? Um, yes, we can. You I can. Slide show. Okay, everyone can see the slides? Yes. Yes, go great. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. My name is Pavel Subutic, uh, and I'll be talking about a static analysis framework for data science notebooks. Um, we're all from Microsoft Azure Data Labs, and this is joint work with um, my former intern, Lazar Milikic, and my colleague, Milan Stoic. And so, as many of you are probably aware of, or even if you're not, you will be, that uh, notebooks are becoming hugely popular for data scientists. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, only in a few years, they've grown um, somewhat exponentially, where in 2020, there's over 10 million uh, notebooks on GitHub. Um, and a lot of the big uh, companies are jumping into this market because they've realized that this is what developers want. They want this kind of um, development environment. Um, on the other hand, it's, uh, it's no secret that notebooks in general tend to have a lot more code issues. And so uh, the obvious uh, question is, can we do some code analysis 
on notebooks. Um, so what do we mean by that? We mean things like if we have this initial notebook um, and if we say we do, do a change and we run cell one, uh, we, wait, we may want to know if we uh, can encounter a data leakage analysis. So this is um, a problem, a uh, particular bug that occurs in data science. Um, and so we can show that if you run cell one, cell four, and then cell five, um, you will end up doing um, training and then uh, you'll do, sorry, some normalization and then afterwards you do some splitting. And this is a well-known problem that will cause what, what's called a data science data leakage. Uh, another problem here you can see in C is that if we uh, execute cell D after a change and we execute cell four straight away, we'll actually get the old value of X uh, that was from the previous computation. And what will happen is you have a silent bug, you'll get this strange result and you'll probably uh, spend uh, a good good amount of time debugging uh, what happened, but it's because you forgot to execute some cells. Now, the real challenge here is that uh, the nature of notebooks is such that you can execute things in any single order. Um, so a notebook is divided into cells, um, and these cells can be executed um, in, in any order, like I said. Uh, they can be added, removed, and so on. And so this makes uh, static analysis somewhat challenging. So what we've so just to demonstrate, you can uh, do uh, you can execute cell three, four, five. That's an absolutely legitimate program. You can execute cell one, four, um, and five. That's also a very legitimate program. Or you can execute one, two, four, five. That's also a legitimate program. And um, when you have unbounded domains, so like addition and integers, you could execute a cell many, many, many times, infinite times, right? And so um, what we've done, we've, we've taken the abstract interpretation framework, which is well known uh, since the late 70s, and we've introduced this phi notion. And this phi tells you um, uh, whether you should propagate your abstract state to the next cell. And uh, each analysis in this framework should define its own phi. It, in the paper, we, we have many examples of, of what a phi would look like for various analyses. But to give you a high level view, since we, we have five minutes here, um, basically we do a normal uh, static analysis, what we call intracell analysis, and we obtain some post abstract state. And now, depending on our phi, we say, oh, which other cells from all our cells in the notebook should we propagate to? And we keep doing that until we reach some terminating condition. And so a terminating condition is that uh, on all paths, uh, you either um, have uh, all the phi's uh, false, so there's nowhere to actually propagate to, or that you actually reach uh, an intercell fixed point, which we define uh, in the paper. Um, so in the worst case, this looks quite bad, right? It, it looks like uh, something that's exponential. But what's really cool in reality is that um, usually uh, each cell isn't, um, isn't, um, uh, isn't uh, connected with all the other cells, right? And so we find this false uh, phi success rate is typically small, and with subsumption and so on, we find that the K that we end up uh, performing uh, to do the analysis is, is also small. So we don't uh, go deep into the, the tree of executions. And that's particularly important because the power, the, the beauty of notebooks is they're interactive, right? So if we had this analysis um, that took a long time, it would really kill that user experience. So uh, using the rail model, uh, we want to keep um, uh, the analysis in under a second, which uh, will not disrupt the user. <clears throat> and that's exactly what we found in these uh, two analysis we've done. Um, we found uh, that we, we say under a second, um, there's a few edge cases, um, but in all, um, in, in most of the, the, the benchmarks we do quite well. Um, and the reason for this, you can see, is that the actual uh, 
phi is on average at about 10%, so only 10% of the time in a cell we actually propagate. And you can see that as the depth increases, so the K, uh, the number of subsumptions that occur increases. And runtimes wise, uh, even if you uh, 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 confine the K to a, a, a finite number, you'll see you don't get much. Well, uh, we do it for. Uh, so, I'm sorry, uh, Pablo, but uh, we, you ran out of time. Um, yeah, one more sentence. Okay, this is the last question. Right. So, anyway, we have many uh, use cases in mind, and uh, we're looking to open source this at the end of uh, this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and we will now move uh, directly to the fourth uh, speaker, uh, Him Soo Kim. Um, um, Paper from the technical track, uh, which also received the best uh, best artifact award on learning probabilistic models for static analysis alarms. Please. I can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, thanks. So, hi, this is Hansu Kim from Kaist. In this talk, I'm going to present about learning probabilistic models for static analysis alarms. This is a joint work with Mukunur Rothman from University of Southern California and my advisor, Kyung Ha. So in static analysis, one of the big challenges is false alarm. Since the alarm report provides a bunch of false, al false and true alarms with no order of significance, a developer has to look into each alarm without any guidance. So, to, so the alarm ranking system was introduced to improve such usability and effectiveness of static analysis. The system initially gives a ranking of the alarms sorted by the likelihood of a, being a bug. The, the developer inspects the alarm from the highest ranked alarms and give a feedback to the system. And the feedback is whether the alarm was true or not. Then, the system integrates the feedback to provide better alarm rankings to the user. This is the typical form of the Bayesian inference that is updating the belief with new information. By the updates, the system would recalculate the probability of the alarms and provide it to, provide it, it to the user. Ideally, the system should push the ranking of true alarms upward within less user interactions. And here's a result with wget. Uh, one of the well-known GNU utility. And with sound inner analysis to detect buffer overflows, we get hundreds of alarms while only six of them are bug. And you may imagine how inefficient it is to go over the entire alarms for a few bugs. And the graph on the right shows how the true alarm rankings change as the user interacts with the system. So the faster the ranking drops to one, the better the system is. An orange dashed line shows the performance of the system, requiring less than 200 rounds of interactions until finding all the bugs. But still, as marked with black arrows, the system shows awkward moments where the true alarm ranking suddenly spikes up. If we could have resolved the moments, we would significantly enhance the performance. That being said, the blue line denotes the performance of our suggested learning framework. The learned model reduces the alarm inspection burden by about half amount additional to the original system. And the problem of the original system is a sudden drop in probability of the true alarm. From the given program, we construct a Bayesian network as shown on the left. And the network captures the data flow within the program, and one may focus on the alarms at the bottom. Blue alarm 8 is a false alarm, and alarm 11 is a true alarm. Let's, let's, uh, let's take it as granted. And two alarms are tightly coupled, just a few nodes far away. Now the problem happens when the feedback of false alarm that is tightly coupled with the true alarm is given to the system. This corresponds to the sudden increase in true alarm rankings that we have just described. We call it false generalization problem. Literally, the problem is due to falsely generalizing, generalizing the feedback from the user to suppress true alarm ranking. 
In the Bayesian network, we can compute the probability of nodes or random variables. Note that initially the true alarm 11 is marked with rather high probability 0.91. Here, when the user says the alarm 8 is false, the system integrates the feedback to recompute the probability of alarms. The computation is nothing but conditional inference over the Bayesian network. But basically, the system propagates the blame of misinforming the false alarm to other facts in the graph. The yellow nodes described describe the blame propagating from the false alarm to the true alarm. The blame causes a drop in probability of the node. If you see the bottom right of the figure, as the feedback is given, the probability of the alarm drops from 0.91 to 0.4. To mitigate the problem, we focused on syntactic information to improve the, to improve the expressiveness of the probabilistic model in addition to the data flow of the program. It can also be easily generalized over programs. For example, here we observe that there is a loop involved in line seven of the program then added to the network. As a result, it effectively mitigates the severe drop in likelihood of the trawler. We can systematically automate the process of adding syntactic information according to the syntax of the programming language. So this becomes the basic idea of our learning framework. And here's the result for the experiments. For evaluation, we count the number of user interactions with the system until finding all the bugs per analysis. Note that the baseline model called bingo marked in blue bars already reduces the number of alarms to be inspected by a large amount. Then the performance of our learning framework are indicated as red bars. With the learned models, we additionally improved by 33% for interval analysis and 22% for taint analysis. If you're interested, we highly recommend reading our paper or even watching the video for the extended version. The extended talk further describes the following details. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Inosu. Um, thank you. Uh, we'll now move to the fifth, uh, fifth talk, uh, another paper from the main technical track on characterizing and detecting bugs in WeChat mini programs. Tao Yang, please. You can start. OK. Uh, anyone can see my screen? Y yes, I can. I can see. OK. Screen. Hello, everyone. I'm Wang Tao from University of Chinese Academy of Sciences. It's my honor to be here and talk about our work characterizing and detecting bugs in WeChat mini programs. WeChat is one of the most popular messenger and social media apps. With WeChat, people can message their friends using text, photos, voice, video, and more. People can also share their favorite moments and enjoy some convenience features provided by WeChat, such as payment. WeChat is more than a messenger and a social media app. It is a lifestyle for over 1 billion users across the world. WeChat mini programs are app-like platforms that exist within the WeChat app itself. They do not need to download and install as Android and iOS apps. With WeChat and the mini programs, people no longer need to install so many apps. When they want to use an app, they only need to find the cross-bounding mini program in WeChat. WeChat mini program development framework contains two layers, the render layer and the logic layer. The render layer is responsible for UI display and logic layer is responsible for program logic written in JavaScript. The two layers run on two independent threads and communicate with each other through an asynchronous and even driven mechanism. WeChat app also provides many native functions for mini program development, such as location, Bluetooth, file access, and payment. However, bugs can occur during the development of many programs, such as JavaScript bugs, compatibility bugs, asynchronous bugs. For convenience, we call WeChat mini program bug as WeBug. To understand WeBugs, we conduct an empirical study to characterize WeBugs and try to investigate the root cause and the fixed strategy of WeBugs. Based on the bug patterns we summarize from our empirical study, we propose a static analysis to we detector and found 11 new bugs. 
We collect 83 V-Bucks from three sources, the GitHub, the official developer forum, and online commercial which are the mini programs. These bugs cover various stages of development. To understand V-Bucks, we try to address two research questions, the root cause and the fixed strategies. We identify six types of root causes. The first is the def differences in execution environments. Next is API misuse. Synaptic errors can also happen in virtual mini programs. Developers often assume that the data achieved from external requests meets their expectations and forget to check their validity. Asynchronized errors can also happen due to the asynchronized and even dream mechanism. For bugs, we cannot classify them into about five types. We group them into the large layer. Let's have a look at an example. Some APIs in which are many programs are platform dependent. For example, the API within door on compass change gets different return values on Android and uh, iOS devices. Therefore, developers should handle them properly. The next case is caused by the incomplete layout adaption to anonymous screens. With the development of mobile phones, more and more components are on the screen, such as camera, top notch, and bottom bar. Rendering programs on the restrained areas can cause some inconvenience. From the finger, we can see that the play button of the video is obscured by the camera. Therefore, developers need to adjust their stack code according to the target device screens. We call this as the safe area. Developers should set their stack code based on the safe area. We found that the fixed strategies of Webux are highly related to their root causes. We summarized four common fixed patterns for almost half of study bugs. Our empirical study on Webux has revealed several potential patterns to detect Webux. Among them, we summarized three common bug patterns. Pattern one is the incorrect invocation of platform dependent APIs. Pattern 2 is the incomplete layout adaption to anonymous screens. And pattern 3 is the improper handling of written data in invoking asynchronized APIs. We detector can detect 11 true V-Bucks in 25 popular mini programs collected from GitHub, and seven of them have been confirmed. The table shows the detailed detection results. In conclusion, we carry out the first empirical study on bugs in many programs. We collect 83 bugs from real-world mini programs and uh, further propose a stack analysis tool to detect them. More details can be found on our website. Thanks for your listening. That's all. Thank you very much, uh, Tao Wang. And uh, we now move to our uh, Last but not least, the uh, speaker, uh, another paper from the technical track uh, on static inference meeting deep learning. Uh, please, uh, Yun Peng. Okay, thank you. So let me share my screen. So uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, hello everyone. This is Yun Peng from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and I'm going to our paper named Study Inference with Deep Learning a Hybrid Type Inference Approach for Python. So, Python Type Inference is a very explored task in the past few years, and generally we can classify the approaches into two major categories. The first category is Study inference techniques, where Perry Checker is a representative. Study inference techniques are accurate, and some of them can even be proven sound, but they usually suffer from the coverage problems as they cannot infer all the variables in the code. The second category is deep learning models. They are future agnostic and free from the coverage problem. They are also very effective on some common types. However, they provide no guaranteeing for the correctness of predictions, and they can never predict unseen types in the data set. So as study inference and learning models both have unavoidable problems, our basic insight is that can we just leverage both techniques to build an approach that have higher coverage while not sacrificing the precision? 
So based on this insight, we propose high typer, and this slide shows an overview of it. To bridge the communication between the study inference and neural prediction, we first propose a novel graph representation named type dependency graph. The type dependency graph maintains the type dependencies between variables and have some empty nodes for high typer to fill the types. Thus, we can reformulate the type inference task into a blank filling problem. After generating a blank type dependency graph from the source code, Hightower then passes it to the study inference part to infer the types. The study inference part has two major components, forward type inference M to infer the types, and backward type rejection M to refill out the wrong predictions from the learning models. So if the study inference part itself handle all the variables in code, then we can get a fully inferred type dependency graph. And in this case, high typer will directly output the result. But in most cases, we can only get a partially inferred type dependency graph due to the coverage problems or some dynamic features and external cause. So under this case, high typer will select some key blanks in it and pass them into the deep learning models for prediction. As high typer is independent of the deep learning model, so here we do not introduce the details about how the deep learning models give the predictions. After high typer gets the predictions from the deep learning models, it uses a similarity based type correction phase to alleviate the issue that deep learning models cannot predict the unseen types. And then it passes the predictions back to the study inference part. The study inference parts will infer the rest of variables and reject the wrong predictions. The interactions between the study and neural predictions may happen several times until Hattaver gets a fully inferred type dependency graph. So in this slide, we show an example of type dependency graph. And actually, there are four kinds of nodes in it. Symbol nodes that indicate the variables we need to infer the types. The expression nodes that indicate the expressions generating new types, and branch and merge nodes that handles the data flow. The most significant part of the type dependency graph is the expression nodes. We design expression nodes for every expression defined in Python's language specifications. And for each expression, we design corresponding rules to infer and reject types. Our rule has the basic format in the right, which means that the expression E has the type delta under the context pi. We also list an example of rule here. In this rule, the first part of the conclusion indicates how we calculate the result type for the expression, and we call them typing rules. The second part indicates how we validate operand types, and we call them type rejection rules. The formal type inference process and backward type rejection process are conducted by the conducted based on these rules. As we store the rules in the expression nodes, we can reformulate the study inference process into a simple graph traversal process. For the neural type prediction, we add two parts to further reduce the wrong types provided by the learning models. The first is a hot type slot finder in which high typer only passes the most important variables for the deep learning models to predict. The second is a similarity-based type correction phase in which high typer maps the never imported type predictions into valid types. This slide shows the performance of high typer, and we can see that high typer shows an 11 to 50% of improvement on overall type inference. And the most significant improvement is on the return value inference, which is 20 to 40%. The bow is a brief introduction about our paper. And to better know our work, you can access the resources listed in these slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yung Peng, for uh, this uh, interesting talk. Uh, this is the last talk in uh, in the six talks that we have, and while now is the, the time for the discussion. Um, there are already some questions, uh, also some answers in the chat, which is great. Um, anyone wants to ask a question or I can uh, uh, ask some questions that are not yet uh, in the chat? 
uh, I see a question for me. Uh, yes, earlier. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, so I, so I, I asked I asked I about you. the the bug report and the revision advice. Right. Yes. And I, so I think I can uh, show an example of the bug report. Okay, that would be great. Uh, okay, can you see my screen? And actually, we we uh, gave a bug report and some advice by a web page like this. And uh, the tool Pluto uh, has already been integrated in the uh, uh, tool uh, developed by VBank named SC Studio. And uh, this is the bug report uh, by SC Studio, actually. And uh, uh, it looks like this. Uh, first, it, it shows the source code of the contract. And uh, it will give an overview of the vulnerabilities uh, detected by the uh, Pluto tool. And we will give the uh, bug, bug type and the lines and the, the level. It is a warning or an arrow. And uh, after that, we will explain uh, each vulnerability uh, with its type and its de de description and some other ways for uh, how to fix this okay. uh, box. OK. And uh, I I, uh, we, we, we generate this uh, web page by uh, so we know that Pluto can give out the bug types. And we, if, uh, after we know the types, we will generate the, uh, uh, this page by its uh, description and its advice and to show the uh, whole information like this. Mm -hmm. OK, I think uh, okay. yeah, that's, that's my uh, answer. Okay. That's very interesting. Um, I have a question. Uh, for uh, Tao Wang uh, about the uh, WeChat uh, mini programs, I'm I'm curious. I'm I'm not an expert in this uh, domain, but I'm curious. What what are the special features of mini programs that make them more buggy or uh, more uh, more difficult to to detect bugs in them, uh, other than other types of code? Uh, can you repeat your question? I cannot follow it. Sure. So I'm I'm asking what are are other special features of uh, WeChat mini programs that make them more buggy than other programs, or maybe uh, features of mini programs that make them more difficult for bug detection. Okay, um, mini programs can be seen as a combination of. Web, applica web applications, Android application, and uh, JavaScript application. Therefore, the traditional JavaScript bugs like type error uh, or some uh, fragment, device, uh, fragment problems in Android ecosystem can also happen in many programs. Uh, many programs can be seen a combination. Therefore, uh, it needs more uh, detection efforts to uh, analyze the specific features. I see. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I have also a question uh, for the last speaker, Yun Peng, uh, um, about the combination of deep learning and static inference. Uh, I saw in your paper that uh, um, you, you're writing that uh, inference of subtypes is, is a challenge. Uh, or maybe you can explain why. Uh, why is it more difficult? Or uh, is it uh, at all possible to, uh, to infer subtypes? Uh, OK. Uh, as uh, for the subtypes, actually, current static inference techniques or some deep learning models can uh, both cannot uh, well handle this problem because uh, actually there is a kind of uh, programming style that the developers, when writing a program, the developers may uh, annotate the type of a variable as the topmost parent type. So even if, for example, if we have two type A and B, and B is the subtype of A, 
However, the uh, to make the code more compatible, the developer may 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 annotate the variable, the type for a variable with actually the type B, but it but they will annotate them as a type. So under this situation, static inference cannot will handle it because static inference just thinks that the type is B. Uh, for the deep learning models, as the deep learning models mostly capture the relationship between the variable names and the variable types, so that uh, if the developer does not name the variable to similar with the type A, then the, then the also not infer the types of the okay. annotations. So actually, this problem exists that the the real type of a variable is not consistent with the annotations given by the developer. So, uh, but actually in, re in, reality, in reality, the annotation of the subtype or annotation of the parent type are both accepted by the type checker. So it depends uh, programming styles of the developers. I see. I see, thank you. Um, are there any questions uh, to any of the speakers? Um, otherwise, I, I can uh, uh, yeah, read uh, one of the questions uh, I wrote in the chat for Pavel. Uh, Pavel uh, um, maybe, Pavel, you want to uh, discuss this uh, question and your answer? Mute. Yes, of course. Go ahead. Uh, okay, do, so, do you want me just to elaborate on it? Or? Yeah. So I asked you about the whether the output of the notebook analysis is is yeah readable and useful for the developers, the, the people who actually wrote uh, and use the notebook. Well, we, firstly, to be transparent, we haven't done any user study, so. Uh -huh. um, we can't like I can't give you any sort of quantitative um, mm -hmm. sort of shown it some some um, like and, and also I want to say we're still working on different uh, models on on how to display this. So we we've sat down with a few data scientists, and so what we've what we've noticed is for some um, some bugs like data leakage, what's really uh, what users really like is if we uh, generate another notebook, which like discards like irrelevant cells and, and is in, or a script even, and then the, the user can start to play with this and kind of learn and, under, and, and convince themselves mm -hmm. um, that this is in fact a, a data leakage and, and they can kind of spot where they went wrong. Um, but uh, in other in other uh, bugs like um, stale cell analysis, um, that doesn't really make sense. And what we've we're more inclined to do is just to sort of highlight it during coding, so they know okay, I, I shouldn't execute this next. So give them a sort of warning. Or if uh, a cell is isolated, completely isolated, uh, we kind of also. Um, color it and, and give an option to, to remove it. Um, so they're the kind of models we're playing with. Um, but I can see I can see a probably a, a CHI paper <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> looking at all the possibilities that, that can happen. It's a it's a yeah it's it's a difficult field um, especially when it's not like a batch uh, processing static analysis but an interactive kind of IDE. Yes analysis yeah, uh, exactly. i think the paper we really we focus on the performance or on the low low latency stuff mm -hmm. i see thank you thank you um i also have a, a question for uh uh Insu. uh i'm again i'm i'm not an expert in this but, and uh i i i'm not sure i just to, uh, maybe you can clarify where do the probabilities that you put in the models where, where do they come from uh, initially and later 
Oh, great. That's a good question. So, as I mentioned, we used uh, well, one of the off the shelf uh, probability probabilistic framework, inference framework called Bayesian network. And uh, for the probabilistic inference to be done in the network, what you need is the prior probability. That's the uh, probability of the node that uh, placed on the top nodes, top the highest nodes, uh -huh. and then the other the other thing is uh, the conditional probability uh, in in the network that is specified as an edge, so that mm -hmm. uh, from the top nodes you apply the base base rule, which is just simply a condition. Uh, the product of the prior pro prior probability and the conditional probability, and by chaining the the computation, you can reach to the uh, lowest alarms, and there okay. are all the probability of alarms. Yeah, that's yeah. how you get it. And the initial inputs for the uh, for this network, where do they come from? That's how the the, the uh, network works, but the initial ones. That, and it comes from uh, it, it comes it comes with hyperparameter, mm -hmm. and we marked it as 0 0.99. And it can be you know uh, it can also be learned uh, trainable. But we okay. but for simplicity we put every top nodes the pro prior probability of every top nodes to be 0 0.99. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why, why it makes sense to start with with this value? Uh -huh. Yeah, great. So, so in this, the very first Bayesian network encodes data flow of uh, data flow within a program. So, and the data by by since we use abstract interpretation framework for our static analysis tool. There may be a an actual data flow from one program point to the other, but it okay. may not because of the sound, you know, sound uh, static analysis. Okay. Pro so, property. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we put point nine nine to be uh, kind to to give to give kind of slack for the probability. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. Um, any other questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, I, I actually have a question for the second speaker uh, with the new ideas paper on uh, the graph neural network. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, I understand the, the, the relation or the um the the exact relevance or application of the the work to software engineers uh, maybe you could uh, uh, explain something about clarify something about the uh, connection of the the work to to software engineering um, clarify is that uh, this work is intended as a way to apply software engineering technique to ML. So, so uh, on the other hand, if we stand in the context of um, so if it stand in the context of software engineering, it can be seen as the uh, development direction of existing analysis technique. Uh, on the other hand, if we if maybe we would prefer a direct application in software engineering, then we may look at the recent application of the graph neural network in the software engineering domain. Um, it occurred to me that the JNN has recently been applied in several software engineering applications such as fault localization at method level and also the detection with explanation. So in that case, I believe that uh, analysis of the uh, JNN-based system would help us to 
solidify the trustability of the system. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, I understand. I understand. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this answer. I understand. I see that there is uh, some interesting discussion going on on the chat. Uh, yeah, anyone has questions to any of the speakers? Yeah. Any question? Um, if there's no other question from the audience. I, I have another question uh, to tie that about the GNN work. Um, could you elaborate on the complexity of the translation from GNN to FF? Again. So I think I should share my screen again uh, for, for that purpose. That's fine. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So let us get back to this slide. So here we give an example of how to transform from a, a computation of the graph node network on a yeah. fixed graph consisting of three nodes, zero, mm -hmm. one, and two into a okay. corresponding or equivalent feedforward node network. So okay. in each feedforward node network layer would be a single linear operation or mm -hmm. affine transform followed by the activation while each message passing would be depending, uh, each message passing operation would be depending on the number of nodes in each layer. Here we have three and the number okay. of edge from that uh, come towards it. So okay. in the case of node Y, it has three edge. In the case of node one, it has one edge from zero. And in the case of node zero, it, it doesn't have any edge toward itself. Mm -hmm. So each of these edge could be transformed into a linear combina uh, linear uh, operation in the message passing scheme. And so it is it's occurred directly that uh, the, num the number of linear operations that required to be compute would be directly uh, proportionate to the number of edge that the input graph have. I see. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Linear in the number of edges. Excellent. Okay. Um, so we're getting to the end of the session. Um, if there are additional questions, you can continue with the uh, with the chat uh, or. Uh, discuss them with the speakers later in the conference. Uh, with that, I would like to thank again the six uh, speakers for the interesting talks. Thanks for the discussion, lively discussion. Uh, sometime in a future conference. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for the organization.